confidence I will see your goodness Lord, in the land I'm living in no matter where I go and no matter where I've been I will see your goodness Lord, in the land I'm living to the daughters sing it to the sons to every generation look how what the Lord has done sing it to the darkness that the light has come sing it to the nations look how what the Lord has done sing it to the daughters Sing it to the sun, to every generation. Look at what the Lord has done. Sing it to the darkness, that the light has come. Sing it to the nations. Look at what the Lord has done. As I bow before you. I'm no longer safe. 
Every stronghold will crumble I hear the chains in the ground God of revival pour it out Pour it out Oh, oh God of revival Darkest, darkest night You take your Bibles out today and open to Psalm 32. Psalm 32. As you are finding that, I'd like to just mention personally from Christy and I and our family how much we appreciate all of you. Um, the outpouring of love and support you've already shown our family is humbling, honestly. Um, I don't, know if, I don't know how to say it. We feel like it's our job to love you. It's our desire to minister to you, to take care of you. And you've done, you've done far and beyond taking care of us and supporting us and loving us. Um, so thank you, church. Thank you. And uh, I just ask that your continued prayers. To, tonight, we'll have the visitation for her mom at 6 o'clock. And then, of course, tomorrow at 1030 is the funeral. Um, so I just ask your continued prayers through those times as well. Um, as we open up here in Psalm 32, we're going to see some very basic definitions that are essential to the gospel. In fact, these are things that the people yesterday, four people here at the church, in fact, who received Jesus as their Savior, they came to confront these truths understand them and respond so that they could be redeemed through the work of Jesus Christ. So we celebrate for those four. We celebrate for the gospel that was shared probably hundreds of times at the park and other places. And today we see that the Old Testament stays true to the gospel of Christ revealed in the New Testament because after all, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he is the living word, and this is Jesus. It's all about him, beginning to end. And so we're going to look at today a basic understanding that most of you probably already have of sin and the blessedness of being delivered from sin. That's our goal, to just dissect that today. So let's look here at Psalm 32. This Psalm of David, he says... Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. 
For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters, they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go, and I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with a bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Here in this psalm, we see the psalmist providing some very good descriptions and understandings of basic elements that you and I really need to grasp. He speaks of sin and the deliverance of the consequence of sin. So I want today to just dissect this psalm in the three parts it displays. It begins with the definition of sin. The psalmist is going to provide a threefold definition of sin here. Now, just to make sure we're coming at this from the same standpoint, let's just make sure we have the same basic understanding. When we speak of sin, I think that most of us in general would describe it as disobedience to God. Generally, if you ask someone what is sin, it's, well, you've disobeyed God. You've done something wrong. And in general, in the big overview, that's probably a good assessment. Sin is disobedience to God. But really, sin should be considered as a wrong relationship with God. A wrong relationship with God that is expressed in wrong attitudes and wrong actions towards God. You see, that's really what sin is. Sin is a wrong relationship with God, a wrong standing before God. It's my inability to interact with God properly. Sin causes that and it's expressed in wrong actions towards God. It's more than simply just disobeying. It's more than I just didn't do what was right. Ultimately, we need to understand that all sin is committed against God. We talk about how people commit sin against others. And, and yes, that's true. That is the reality. I can commit a sin towards you. But ultimately, what I've done is I've committed sin against God. In fact, in Psalm 51.4, the scripture says, Against you and you only, God, have I sinned. All sin is committed against God. We stand guilty before God because of sin. Now, sin, when we discuss it, is, is, is this root of the human heart. In fact, it's rooted in the human heart. It's the result of a sin nature that we have been born into. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, the Bible says that sin comes from fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. I sin, why? Because I'm a sinner. That's why I was born into it, and I'm carrying out the desires of a sinful heart, of a sinful mind. I'm fulfilling the desires of the flesh. That's where sin is rooted. It's rooted in the human heart. I do what I do because I want what I want, and what I want is my heart to be gratified. And under a sin nature, that's a sinful gratification, a sinful desire. The Bible says that our hearts are desperately wicked. So what we find is that all human beings are guilty in the sight of God for sin. We understand that it is only God who is able to break the power of sin in our lives. It is only God who can deliver us from the consequence and the penalty of sin. It is only through the atoning death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that any of this is possible. So as we get into this psalm and we look at the definition of sin, that is the framework from which we work. So let's jump in. How does this psalm define sin? Well, it's a threefold definition beginning with verse 1 and carried over to verse 2. You'll notice the phrase there in verse 1, the word transgression. Transgression. Transgression is a word that means to revolt or rebel against God. It is to be in defiance to God. When the psalmist here, when David talks about transgression, he's talking about defying God. Those things he's done that has been in defiance 
to God. It is to act in contradiction to God's specified expectations. Here's what God expects of me, I act differently. Here's what God tells me to do, I do something in contradiction. I have defied his expectation. I have transgressed the Lord. That's why continually God tells his people, you have transgressed my law. You have acted in defiance to my law. You have known what the law says, yet you have done something contrary to the law. You've transgressed my law. So sin in this regard is the expression of defiance to the lordship of Jesus Christ. I'm defying his authority. I'm defying his lordship. I'm acting contrary to that. In this act of defiance, I am guilty of disobedience. I'm guilty of sin. In fact, I think when you look at original sin as documented in Genesis 3, you remember we had Adam and Eve back there and they ate of a fruit they shouldn't have? I think there you see a perfect example of transgression. You have them knowing exactly what God's expectation is, what God's command is, yet they will not submit to his lordship and they defy his authority by acting contrary to what he said. They transgressed his law. They're guilty of transgression. So the psalmist is going to define sin, and he begins by saying this. We sin when we defy the lordship of Jesus. When we act contrary to what we know are his expectations. Now, I think you would agree with me. That's pretty easy to understand. If I know what God expects and I do something differently, well, sure, that's sin. So, okay, we can deal with that. We've got that one. Well, the psalmist goes on, still in verse 1. After he mentions transgression, notice the next line. He talks about sin, S-I-N. So transgression is sin, but then he uses the word sin specifically. Now, this word sin, when you look in its original meaning, refers to taking aim but missing the target. To see the bullseye, to aim at the bullseye, but to miss the bullseye. It is to miss the mark of God's standard of perfection. This is not sin because I'm defying God. This is sin because I cannot meet his standard of perfection and holiness. This is sin we see in the lives of good people, moral people, people who are religious people, people who are engaged with the church, people who are doing things that are good. But their efforts to be right with God fall vastly short because they miss the mark of his perfection, of his holiness. They can't hit the bullseye of God's holiness because of sin, because of the sin they were born into. This is an infraction, an infraction against God's holy standards that incurs a penalty that must be paid. So what we find here is that missing the standard of God's holiness is an infraction that incurs a penalty that must be paid. There's a consequence. There's consequences simply from not being able to achieve the perfection of God because of our sinful nature. In fact, I want you to understand, we are incapable of achieving and maintaining the perfect standard of God. We cannot meet his standard of holiness regardless of how moral or good or righteous we try to be. That is why the Bible tells us in Romans 3 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That verse there doesn't refer to everyone is a vile reprobate going out, destroying people's lives and murdering people and stealing and defaming people and lying about people. And it simply means you've missed the mark of God's perfection. All have sinned and fallen short because none of us can achieve his holiness. Because of the sin nature we're born into, our very best efforts to be right with God fall short and we face the consequence of sin. So what this tells us, the psalmist is revealing this so that we understand that really, really, really good people, really, really moral people 
still fall short of God's standard of perfection and are guilty and face the consequence of sin. In fact, the prophet Isaiah wrote this in Isaiah 64. But we all are like an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind carry us away. My very best pursuit of holiness and all the righteousness I can muster added together still falls vastly short of God's expectation of holiness and perfection. I cannot achieve it in myself. I cannot meet the standard of holiness required. When the psalmist explains this aspect of sin, it clarifies exactly what we see written in the New Testament epistles where they explain that salvation doesn't depend on us at all. In fact, it is the complete work of God because even in our best efforts, we fall short of God's standards. So when we read things like, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, we understand because even our best efforts fall short because of our sin nature. So salvation is the work of God, given to us by the grace of God, based on his love and mercy. It's applied and acquired through our faith in Jesus. It's not of ourselves, it comes from God. It's his work from beginning to end because of sin and our inability to reach his standard. So today, I want you to understand that none of our efforts, none of our righteousnesses, none of our religious works, no matter how grandiose our moral efforts might be, we cannot become perfect with God in and of ourselves. We need the blood of Christ applied to our lives to achieve that because we're guilty of sin. Missing the mark. See, sin as described here is the effect of the sinful nature that we're born into. It's not that I'm openly defying God's authority. It's simply I was born into a sin nature. I was born under the curse of sin, separated from God, and I can't achieve his perfection. That's what the psalmist is referring to here. But then he goes on. He provides a third A third definition or a third aspect of defining sin. Here in verse 2, notice the phrase that the Lord does not impute iniquity. Iniquity is the third aspect of defining sin that he provides us. Iniquity. Now, iniquity refers to perversity and depravity. It is taking... God's standard of morality and trying to act contrary to that. It's being deliberate. You see, it's being warped and crooked. That's what the word means, to be warped and crooked, to take God's standards of morality and twist and pervert them. It's to take God's divine design and pervert it, twist it, and corrupt it. That's iniquity. It's when I'm out of alignment with God's design. When I deliberately twist and pervert what God has designed for my life. Iniquity is described by the prophet when he says this. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light, light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. In the perverseness and depravity of the human heart, this is the person who will take what God has declared to be righteous and say, no, that's not right. They'll take what's evil and declare it to be what's right and normative for life. These are the people from the depravity of the heart who will warp and twist God's design. Sin, in this definition, comes in the form of willingly, willingly taking that which God deems morally acceptable and corrupting it to fit the depravity of the human heart. 
So I can be comfortable in this because I've taken God's design and twisted it so that now I'm comfortable in the life I live. This description is a description of those who would callously trod upon God's holiness. They'll take the holy things of God, God's holy design, and callously just walk all over it to fit their own desires. Here you find the perversion of God's design for marriage. In this you find the perversion of God's design for sexuality. You find the perversion of God's design for the sanctity of life. This is perversion stemming from the depravity of the human heart that twists and corrupts God's design. And so in defining sin, the psalmist takes us to the person who is in defiance to God, the person who, well, they're trying, but they can't be perfect because of their sin nature, and the person who openly, in the depravity of their heart, perverts the things of God. And he says, sin includes all these things. Sin is every one of these. When we talk about iniquity, I want you to know one last verse just to kind of get a feel for it. It's Romans 8, beginning with verse 5. It says this, For those who live according to the flesh, they set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Did you catch what Paul said there in Romans? To have such a twisted and corrupted, perverted view of God's morality puts you at odds with God, makes you the enemy of God because you will not be subject to his law, it says, nor can you be because you're so depraved and acting out the depravity of your heart, you've removed yourself so far, you will not be under the subject of God's authority or his law and you'll do everything you can to rebel against it and you'll never please God. We have a world of people in this boat. And their influence becomes more and more prevalent. Those who act out in sin simply by being contrary to the moral standards of God, perverting God's intent to fulfill the depravity of the human heart. So we have sin defined. And in that definition of sin, if we're honest, we have to realize each one of us fall into a category. Of sin. It includes all of us. We all are guilty. Transgression, sin, iniquity. In the overall summation of that definition, we find that each of us are guilty. And if each of us are guilty, then it behooves us to understand what happens because of sin. But the psalmist here expresses it. He moves from the definition of sin to the detriment of sin. He moves us to explain, because of sin, here's what you can expect, and it is not good. The detriment of sin that comes into life. And what we find in this psalm is that, in, is that unaddressed sin, and that's key now, unaddressed sin brings severe consequences. Sin that is unaddressed brings very severe consequences. Notice in verse 3 what he says. See how that verse starts? When I kept silent, when I would not address my sin, when I kept my mouth closed, when I refused to acknowledge it, when I would not admit it, when I would not confess, when I kept silent, That is when I had unconfessed sin. That is when I had hidden sin. That is when I harbored sin in my life. There were bad consequences. Severe things happened. What we come to see here in this text is those who would ignore God's call to repentance, 
those who would try to hide their sin, or those who just willingly embrace sin and harbor it in their lives. They bring suffering upon themselves. We're going to get to the description of that, but before I do, listen to Lamentation 120. See, O Lord, that I am in distress. My soul is troubled. My heart is overturned within me, for I am rebellious. I've sinned. And because I have sinned, and I've harbored it in my life, he says I'm in distress, my soul is troubled, my heart is overturned within me. You see, my friends, here's what you can know for sure. Sin causes us to be distressed and troubled so that our heart and mind is in turmoil. There is no peace. There is no lasting joy. All you find is discontentment and frustration when your life is harboring sin. When you have a lifestyle of sin, when you're outside the realm of God's grace, you're not even in a relationship with him because of sin, or you're one of his children who've gone off into sin, the reality is this, discontentment and frustration will define your life. Psalm 107, 17 says, because of sin, I am troubled. That's what sin does for you. It just brings trouble. There is no peace of mind or contentment of life when sin dominates. Unaddressed sin causes problems. David here explains some of them. In the psalm, he describes the discontentment and the frustration. He describes this distress that sin causes. Look at verse 3. Here, see his description? My bones grew old. How you doing today? Oh, my bones are old. Yeah, that don't sound good, does it? My bones grew old. When I harbored sin in my life, I became weary because I was eaten from within and I just was weary and heavy laden. Who wants to go through life like that? Continuing in verse 3, he explains further. My bones grew old because my groanings all the day long. From the time I woke up to the time I finally was able to get some sleep, I lived my life in groaning. My life each and every day has become arduous and difficult under the weight of sin and the consequence of sin in my life. It's a grueling battle just to make it through the day. That's what sin does in your life. He moves on into verse 4. He says, my vitality turned into the drought. I lost my vitality. See, life lived in sin is one in which the vigor for life wanes as vitality is just sucked out of you. Those people who have lived a lifestyle of sin continually for years and they've lived under the burden of sin continually, they finally get to this place and they say, oh, I just don't even, it's not even worth it. What? I just can't go anymore. It's like life has been sucked out of me. You're right, sin has done it to you. That's what sin does. Look at the description in verse 10. Many sorrows shall be. Well, how do you want to live your life? Well, I'd like many sorrows to be in my life. Well, harbor sin, and that's what comes. When I harbor sin in my life, or when I hide sin in my life, when I have unconfessed sin in my life, many sorrows shall be. A life where my joy is robbed away, and I just define my existence in sorrow. That's what sin does when it's unaddressed. And the really, the reason why these are true is because what the Lord is doing in our lives. Look at verse 4 again. Your hand was heavy upon me. Wow. This frustrated and discontented life we experience as we harbor sin 
It's evidence that God's hand is heavy upon us. Now this is really for his children here. Those who have come to a saving knowledge of Christ and are now harboring sin. But the picture is this. God's taking his hand and just pressing. And the more you harbor sin, the more he just leaves his hand there. You try to live life under the burden of God's hand upon you. You see, God in his righteousness and his holiness, he detests sin. He detests what sin does to humanity. But out of his grace and love, he makes every effort to draw us to the place of repentance. And sometimes, sometimes simply revealing to us his grace and love is enough to, to be the catalyst to draw us to a place where we'll say, God, I'm sorry, let me confess before you my sin. Sometimes simply realizing. Sometimes just that initial conviction of the Holy Spirit and, and realizing we've transgressed God and where our heart is broken and we call out to him. But more often than not, it's not the simple way. More often than not, it's the grievous conviction of the Holy Spirit. More often than not, it is God through his divine provision allowing the consequence of sin to afflict us. It's God through his wisdom allowing the pressures of life to draw us to this place of repentance. It's him taking his hand and saying, I'll push because I love you and I won't let you go, but I'll apply the pressure it takes because I want you to come to the place of repentance and confession and be in right fellowship with me again. The life of sin is a miserable life, my friends, because it's a life lived outside the realms of God's blessing and, in fact, lived in opposition to him. So if you are one of his children, you've come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and you begin to harbor sin in your life, and you hide sin in your life, you have unconfessed sin in your life, what happens is your heavenly Father, who loves you enough to bring discipline into your life, won't allow you to be free with joy and just to ramble through life. He will put his hand upon you and say, I will bring my divine chastisement upon you because I love you enough to do what it takes to draw you back to me. Those who are outside the family of faith, who, who have never come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, God, with his wisdom, still from his grace, allows you to experience the consequence of sin, to experience the negative effects in your life, continue to bring conviction upon you through the Holy Spirit until you realize one day, wait a minute, this isn't working for me. Maybe I do need to respond to God, and maybe I do need to bow before the Lord Jesus your hand was heavy upon me. That is not a description I want of my life. I prefer how James says that he exalts and lifts up the humble, lifts them up. That's the category I'd like to be in, not the category of unconfessed sin. When we talk about the detriment of sin and the consequence of sin, I can't move on until we make sure you understand what the Bible says is really the ultimate consequence of sin, and that is death. The Bible very clearly teaches, although David doesn't mention it directly in this psalm, the Bible very clearly teaches that ultimately the consequences of sin is death. And death there means separation. The Bible tells us, therefore, just as through man sin entered the world and death through sin, so death has spread to all men, for all have sinned. Death is reality because of sin. When Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, death entered the world because sin and the consequence of sin entered the world. Under the curse of sin, death has become a reality, and death is separation. Physical death is a reality. What is physical death? It is a separation from this earthly world and loved ones here. That's what physical death is. It's a separation. And because of sin, that is a reality for every one of us. Death is a reality. We face that physical separation from this world. But sin, as described throughout the epistles of the New Testament, brings the separation on a spiritual plane. 
When it talks about death, it's speaking of spiritual death, spiritual separation from God. The ultimate penalty of sin is spiritual separation from God. It is being alienated from God in this life. Those who are condemned under sin right now because they were born into sin are alienated from God. You're separated from God right now. You have no communion with the true and living God. You have no access to him. You're living this life on your own. You may practice religion. You may have rituals. You may have things to try to bring yourself a peace of mind. But the reality is you have no access to God. You're separated from God because of sin. The Bible teaches that that separation carries on throughout eternity. You're alienated from God here because of sin. You're alienated from God throughout eternity because of sin. When you leave this world, you enter into the eternal realm where you are still separated from God, only you're separated from God in a place the Bible calls hell. It says it's a place of a lake of fire that it was built and designed for Satan and the angels that followed him, but nonetheless has become the eternal dwelling place of all those who refuse to accept Jesus as their savior. They are separated from God. They are spiritually dead. They face the spiritual death throughout eternity. Now, <clears throat> you and I can't escape physical death. That's the reality. But spiritual death does not have to be our reality. Spiritual separation from God does not have to be an experience of anyone here. Because although the consequence of sin is death, the Bible says the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The reality is Jesus stepped into our place, took our sin, died for us, paid for our sin, that he could offer forgiveness of sin and rescue us out of that spiritual separation, unite us with God, make us part of God's family, give us a home in heaven. Spiritual death is not the reality for those who've come to faith in Jesus. So the ultimate consequence of sin is death. And that spiritual death is not a consequence you have to face God promises in Romans 10 that whoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved, if you're willing to call on his name. So you see, sin is defined, the detriment of sin is discussed, but the psalmist is going to close by talking about the deliverance of sin. The Bible tells us it's not God's desire that people be separated from him. It's not God's desire that anyone should go out into eternity and experience eternal damnation. That's not God's desire. And because it's not God's desire, he took action to deliver us from the consequence of sin. He took action to correct this problem. What we couldn't fix, he's already fixed. And the psalmist is going to discuss this. He's going to reveal that it is in God's grace and in his mercy that he provides deliverance from sin and its power and the consequences of sin. In fact, he's going to talk about three specific descriptions. That's what we see. In this psalm, there are three specific descriptions of God's deliverance from sin. Just as he used three terms to define sin, he uses three terms to talk about the forgiveness of sin. Verse 1, he speaks of being forgiven. See that word there? Transgressions forgiven. Forgiven. Forgiven means to bear the guilt for another so that they are freed from the debt they owe. If I forgive you, I bear the debt you owe me and I let you out of it. That's what God does because of our sin. To be forgiven means God takes the debt of sin we owe him, takes it off of us, assumes it himself, and lets us out of it. He forgives the debt. You see, because of sin, we all owe a debt to God that we cannot pay. There's no way we could pay it. But he has forgiven that sin debt by absorbing it himself. Our sin has been absorbed, has been taken, our debt can be forgiven because Jesus paid the debt. Colossians 2, 13, 14. 
And you who were dead in trespasses and in the circumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all of our trespasses by canceling the record of the debt that stood against you with legal demands. He set aside it, nailing it to the cross. What did God do with my sin debt? He took it upon himself and nailed it to a cross. How can I be forgiven? Because Jesus took my sin debt paid it for me, that God could look at me and say, you're forgiven of that debt. The debt I couldn't pay, Jesus paid for me so that I could be forgiven. So when we see the word forgiven there, that's what it's referring to. That Jesus assumed the liability and settled my account for me so that the debt of sin was paid on my behalf and Almighty God could look at me and say, that debt is forgiven you. You don't owe it to me anymore. That's forgiven. He goes on and uses another word. Still in verse 1, whose sin is covered. Covered. Part of having our sin forgiven is the aspect of having our sin covered. That word covered there means to conceal shame and put it out of sight. It is to cover sin by removing the guilt of sin and the offensiveness of sin is to have your sin and your guilt covered from God. Think of it this way. The psalmist says sin is covered. What he refers to is God is not responding in the knowledge of our sinfulness with the vengeance we deserve. But he's covering the guilt of our sin with something different. And we know that to be the blood of Christ. God in his holiness has every right to hold us accountable and act out in the wrath he carries out against sin. But rather than doing that, he covers our guilt with the blood of Jesus. We are covered with the blood of Jesus, the filthiness, the vileness of sin. It's cleansed by this covering blood of Christ. That's what he's done. In Hebrews chapter 10, almost... Half the, half the chapter talks about this. That Jesus offered himself once and finally one final perfect sacrifice because his blood was offered as the covering for our sin to provide the atonement of our sin. We're covered under the blood of Christ. Our guilt is covered before God. See, Jesus became sin so that we could become righteous. Because we're covered by his blood. When God looks at one of his redeemed, what he sees is the righteousness of Christ upon them, not the guilt of their sin. Because they've been covered. It's not that I deserve it. It's not that I earn it. It's that God in his grace, out of his mercy and abundant love, has offered it. So that when God looks at me, he sees me through the covering of the blood of Christ and declares me righteous before him. So to be forgiven is to be covered. The psalmist goes on. One last definition of forgiveness he offers here. Verse 2. He says, The Lord does not impute iniquity. To be forgiven is to understand that sin is not imputed to us. Now, impute, that word means to keep an accounting, to make an account by commanding a proper reckoning so that one can be properly charged with an offense. It's that I've kept a perfect account I've called for the reckoning of the perfect consideration so that I can charge someone perfectly with what they did wrong. That's what it means to impute. If my sin is imputed against me, God pulls up his perfect record, goes through and reckons everything that's there, and then properly charges me of my guilt. But here David says God does not impute. See, to be forgiven is to understand that our sin is not imputed towards us. 
God does not command a proper reckoning of my sin so that he can charge me with my offense. That's because the reckoning of my sin and the proper charge for my sin has already been carried out. God did demand a reckoning of sin. He did place a proper charge of guilt for sin, but he placed it upon Jesus Christ because my sin was imputed to him. Rather than God imputing sin to me, he took my sin and imputed it to Christ. Romans 3, 25, 26. Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and justifier of the one who has faith in Christ. God from the foundation of the world, the Bible says, knew I couldn't fix sin, I couldn't overcome sin, I couldn't be good enough because of sin. So he set forth a plan before the world was even began to take care of my sin for me, and that plan involved Jesus Christ stepping into this world, God in human form, so that my sin could be imputed to him. My guilt, my offense could be placed on him. And the Bible says he's become the propitiation for our sin. He stepped in as our substitute, died in our place, that he might remove the wrath of God from us. That's what that word means. He has removed God's wrath from us because he took God's wrath for us. God does not impute sin to me because it was placed upon Jesus and his wrath has been satisfied. You see, God makes available to us, friends, Forgiveness, covering, not imputing sin to us by the means of Jesus Christ's atonement, his death on the cross, and his resurrection from the dead. That's where deliverance of sin is found. Not in my good efforts, not in my moral life, but in the work of Jesus Christ. That's how this is possible. But you should understand that enjoying the blessing of forgiveness depends on our response to sin. God's taken care of sin. He's imputed sin to Christ. Christ has borne our guilt. He's died in our place. He's taken God's wrath for us. Jesus has completed that work. But it still has one variable, the wild card. How will you respond to sin? Forgiveness is there. Covering is there. Not having it imputed to you, it's there. Eternal life, it's the gift, it's there. But how will you respond? See, forgiveness comes when we acknowledge our sin instead of trying to hide it. You said in verse 5, I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess. How do I experience the forgiveness of God? When I acknowledge my sinfulness before him. When I will bow before him with a repentant heart, a broken and contrite heart that says, God, I am guilty of sin. How can I experience this blessed deliverance? It begins when I acknowledge my own guilt and call it out before God. See, Christ has atoned for sin, and that atonement can be applied to our lives, but not if we hide sin, not if we harbor sin, but when we acknowledge sin and bow before him in confession. That verse says, I will confess to the Lord. That's when forgiveness comes, my friends. Forgiveness comes when we confess our sinfulness. And that simply means to agree. Do you realize that? Confess means agree with God. It means no excuses. It means no justifications. It's simply God I must agree with you that what I've done today, that was sin. It was wrong. I'm guilty. God, the life I've lived, that is a life of sin. And no one bears responsibility but me. I am guilty. See, to experience deliverance, forgiveness, we confess. Now, some of you born-again believers here, now you, you like to whip out a verse like it's a James Bond gadget or something, right? 1 John 1, 9. 
If I confess, he's faithful and just to forgive me. I sins, clean me off and righteous. I confess, God. I did it. God, I'm sorry. I, I, I sinned, God. No, 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 no. That's not confess. That's lip service. Confess is a brokenness within that says, God, I sinned against you. And what you say in your word is true, and I am sorry. You're right. I transgressed you today. I sinned against you today. I acted out in iniquity today. God, I'm sorry. That's confessing. So to enjoy the benefits of deliverance, we have to confess. We acknowledge sin. But notice also, we respond immediately. In verse 6, when does this happen? In a time when God may be found. That's when it happens. When God reveals sinfulness to us, that's when you respond. I don't wait. When God's Spirit convicts me of my sin, that's when I should deal with it, not later. It didn't go on the to-do list. If I'm lost and undone, I'd, I've never come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, the moment the Holy Spirit speaks to my heart, that's when I should respond. If that's you right now, you should respond. In the moment that God could be found, because maybe he can't be found tomorrow. And as a child of God, when your Holy Father will apply his spirit and bring a conviction upon you, that's the time to deal with it. I don't know how many of you had good, faithful fathers growing up, but I tell you what, if my dad had something to say to me, I couldn't say, hey, dad, I'll handle that later. Get back with you. You didn't walk away from him when he was talking to you about something he had talked to you about. You stopped and you dealt with it. That's what you do with sin. When your holy, heavenly father says, hey, child, you're out of bounds here. You went off the track there. I don't approve of this there. You stop and you respond. You handle it. You take care of it. You stop right there and say, you're right, Father. I confess. I did step out of bounds with you there. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? You see, that's how we begin to enjoy the blessings of forgiveness. Now, I have two more pages of an outline, but I'm going to give it to you in half a page. Are you ready? Just if you're taking notes, good luck. Because the psalmist here gives a list of blessings that come from forgiveness. There's a list here. He says, when I experience the forgiveness of God, there are some blessings I have experienced in my life. And he talks about them. Here we go. Fast forward speed. The first one, access to God. He says, everyone who is godly shall pray. How can they pray? Because they've been forgiven. They've been granted access to God. They have access to God. They can talk to God. See, the repentant sinner is pulled from alienation. He's pulled from separation so that he or she can experience God personally. Those who haven't come to, to faith in Jesus, they don't know God. They can't talk to God. They can't commune with God. They don't have access to God. Now, they may pray a lot, but that's not the prayer God hears. The only prayer of a sinner God hears is the prayer of repentance where they're calling out in faith. But after that, we have access to God. We come boldly to his throne. There's no separation. We're redeemed and can approach the true and living God. Unless, as a child of God, we harbor sin. And according to um, Isaiah 59, if we harbor sin as God's children, well, he turns his face from us. It causes a separation from us. It breaks our fellowship. But in a forgiven state where we've confessed and we're not harboring sin, we have access to God. Here's the second blessing he says, the preservation and the help of God when facing troubles. Because I have been forgiven and because I have access to God, verse 7, you are my hiding place. You will preserve me in trouble. God, you are my help. When I'm in right relationship with you, you're a very present help. God, you preserve me. You help me to live a life that honors you because I'm living in a forgiven state. The third blessing Songs of deliverance. Songs of deliverance. Verse 7, you shall surround me with songs of deliverance. Listen, when you walk in life and live in life knowing you have been delivered from the punishment of sin, it produces with you and you a heart of celebration. You're surrounded in songs of deliverance. You have a hope, a living hope you live in, a joyfulness you live in. You're surrounded with the celebration of Christ's salvation, the eternal life he has imparted. It transforms how you view life. Number four, instruction of God. When I am living in a forgiven state, God is there to instruct me, and I receive that instruction. Verse 8, I'll instruct you and teach you in the ways you should go. When I'm in proper relationship with God, he instructs me through his word to abide in his ways, to know his will. 
I understand his purpose in my life because I'm living in a forgiven state. Verse 5 goes, or number 5 goes along with it, the fifth blessing, and that's guidance from God. Verse 8, I will guide you with my eyes. You see, in our forgiven state, as we're forgiven through Christ and we're living in a forgiven state with God, in that redeemed state of forgiveness, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And he leads us, he guides us, he directs us. He keeps a watchful eye over our goings, our comings. He directs with spiritual guidance and leadership our lives. The sixth blessing, mercy from God. In the forgiven state, David says here in verse 10, mercy shall surround me. Mercy of God becomes a blanket that I'm wrapped in. I abide in a state of God's mercy because I'm living in a forgiven state before God. In this forgiven condition, God's mercy is, is filled. It's because I'm not living in fear, by the way, of God's wrath. When I'm living in the mercy of God and not in fear of his wrath, well, life's pretty good. One last thing. David says here that when I live in a forgiven state, one final blessing that I enjoy is that of rejoicing and joy in God. Verse 11, be glad in the Lord and rejoice. He says, shout for joy there. Shout for joy. It is only when I truly walk in the forgiveness of Jesus Christ that I will experience joy in life and can rejoice in life. You see, when I'm living, living in an unforgiven state, I won't live in joy. But when I walk in the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, I walk in a life of joy and rejoicing because I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So this morning I have to ask you, where do you fit in the realm of sin and forgiveness? Where do you plug in at? And are you moving to the place where you live in the blessings of forgiveness, the deliverance Jesus has provided you.